Good morning and welcome. Please stand as you are able and body your spirit. Let us sing together. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. with us. God of faithful surprises, throughout the ages you have made known your love and power in unexpected ways and places. May we daily perceive the joy and wonder of your abiding presence and offer our lives in gratitude for our redemption. Amen. Amen. My friends, God be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
A reading from Isaiah. Have you not known, have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us read responsively from Psalm 147, breaking at the asterisk. Hallelujah. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares earth for the rain. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve humankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who await his gracious favor. Hallelujah.
Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message and casting out demons. Please be seated. If you have noticed that I was wearing a mask earlier and I'm not now, I uh, learned I had a COVID exposure uh, at our diocesan convocation. I have tested, I'm fine, I'm feeling fine, but full disclosure, those of you who in what we would call at SeaWorld the splash zone, if, if you feel like you need to get up and move back, I won't get my feelings hurt at all. The heaviness of the vision was taking its toll on George. <laughs> Over the years, I've told this story of George Moore, a Presbyterian minister who, in the 1960s, was exploring an Appalachian mountain down in North Carolina when he was overcome by a vision. And out of nowhere, he started to hear the sound of children singing and playing. And he believed that this vision was of God, and so he, he knew that he had to create something there. So he found the person who owned the land, and he agreed to purchase that mountaintop with money that, technically speaking, he did not have. And then he began to lay the foundations for a camp. Now, anyone who has ever cleared brush knows that it takes about four times longer than you think it's going to take. And if you've overextended yourself and are now fighting back nature with nothing more than borrowed money and elbow grease and a few friends kicking in, then that slow pace is bound to weigh on you like a cinder block. Well, one day, George and his friend Jerry, Jerry was helping out with some of the work, they needed supplies, and so they went down into town to Marshall, North Carolina. It's about a half hour north of Asheville to go to the hardware store and to buy supplies. Well, this was, as you can imagine, kind of a small town-ish. Everybody knew everybody's business, and, and the gentleman at the, at, the, at the counter said, say, you, you're those guys who are up in the, up in the hill making, laying foundations for that new camp. How's it going? How's it going, George? The answer was, before he could open his mouth, badly. <laughs> Slowly. Acres of brush and trees and roots left to clear. Soil filled with massive rocks. The burden of borrowed money sitting like one of those stones in George's belly. 
And George opened his mouth to tell the truth. He opened his mouth to say, drew in his breath to tell the truth and to unburden himself just a little bit, get just a little bit of, of vent ther ventilation therapy. But before he could speak, from right over his shoulder, clearly oblivious, his friend Jerry jumps right in and he says, why, we're right on schedule. And George at first wanted to turn to Jerry and say, are you out of your mind? But before he did, he realized that God might just be speaking through his friend Jerry in that moment. We are right on schedule. George was humbled by the spirit that spoke through his friend, saying this is a holy thing, and therefore not entirely on your time. Not on your schedule, but on mine. And beloved, we are right on schedule. Now, happy annual meeting Sunday. Whee, let's have balloons falling down, right? How exciting. If this is your first time at Trinity, oh, lucky for you. Um, you don't have to stay for that, but you're welcome to. This is when we elect leaders. This is when we talk about bylaws and where we've been. Uh, it is a milestone year, by the way. I know I've talked a bit about this. It is, I just hit five years as the dean. I promise I'm not going to do this every year. Oh, six years. Oh. But this is a significant moment and a chance to talk about it. And in my dean's forum last Sunday, I did that. We talked about what the past five years have been like, some of the challenges, some of the exciting things. But there have been hard times. Talked about pandemic talked about extended transition. We talked about some hard things that we were not expecting and some headwinds that just didn't want to let up. But there have also been incredible things, surprises, opportunities that we never saw coming. And this is a moment to gather in all of them. And now that we've been growing for, again, for a few years, we can look back over our shoulder with some courage and acknowledge that there have indeed been some hard times. But perhaps the Spirit had something in mind. Perhaps the Spirit wanted us to take some time so that we could truly go from strength to strength. To grow into new areas of ministry and discipleship that celebrate who we are and who we have always been while calling us to go ever farther into this wild journey of faith. There have been hard seasons, but there have been good seasons as well. And perhaps God has had something in mind for us. Maybe we are right on schedule after all. The Holy Spirit moves on her own time. She moves through time and change in ways that are mysterious to us and often opaque. The Spirit and being faithful doesn't necessarily that it's going to be any clearer to us. The Spirit's movement through time is not linear. We expect it to be, but it never is. It is cyclical and best, and more often it's erratic or just plain wacky. And it is not something that responds well to hurrying. The curious thing about the Holy Spirit's schedule, though, is that the very minute we've we figured this one thing out, that the Spirit moves on her time, and if we want to hurry, uh, maybe that's about us, and so we have to slow down and come alongside the pace of the Spirit. The funny thing about it is the minute we think we figured that part out, the Holy Spirit now turns back to us and says that it is time to get off of our keisters and get moving again. Last week, we screened the Philadelphia 11 about the courageous women who defied convention and canonical process to become, the in 1974, the first women ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. And there we sat, here we sat, right here, with Nancy Wittig, one of those first 11, with Gay Clark Jennings, the first ordained woman who's president of the House of Deputies, deputies 
with Bishop Ann Jolly. Here we sat at the crossing as they told their stories of blazing this trail of women's leadership. And there we, we heard, we watched the film, we heard the incredible story of the 11 who affirmed for all of us what brave leadership really looked like, what, the, what its cost was, but also what it made possible. How could we listen to that and not know that the Holy Spirit was moving all through this process just as the Holy Spirit continues to move through us and challenge us today. That the Holy Spirit's um, agenda was clearly unfolding then and that something was happening on schedule. But paradoxically, we were at the same time profoundly not on schedule because it shouldn't have been 50 years ago. It should have been 100 years ago, hundreds of years ago. This was a movie about ministry and liberation, but it was also a movie about power, about those many people, mostly men, who used their power, who needed to hold on to it so much that they became blinded to the unfurling of grace all around them and for years upon years managed to keep it completely rolled up so that the unfurling never happened. How many centuries have we lost because our church was not on schedule? Look at the things that plague us as a nation. How many years, decades, and centuries have we lost because of the ways that we have not been, that we have been well behind schedule? When we want to hold on to power, we're generally trying to just mess with God's schedule and try to get it to conform to, to whatever path we think we're on and the one that keeps us plugging along uh, in whatever way benefits us most. But if Scripture teaches us anything, it's that the kingdoms of this world really stink at schedule keeping. We read this morning, God brings the princes to naught makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely have their stems taken root in the earth when God blows upon them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. It's painful if that's the world you know but it may also be right on schedule. We are not giants. We are not princes, Isaiah tells us, but he does tell us that we are, and I love this, we are grasshoppers. We are grasshoppers. That, by the way, was the minor league baseball team uh, in the town that I came from, the Greensboro Grasshoppers, a great mascot. Now. If only that meant to say that we are the grasshoppers and we wore our, our wonderful baseball hats with the hoppers on it, if only that meant that we are claiming to be people of humility who know God's schedule and are okay with it. God, in your infinite grace, let me be a grasshopper. Living on the Spirit's time means recalibrating our sense of when to hurry up and when to slow down and listen to the still, small voice of God. This discernment. This is what aligning ourselves with the movement of the Spirit is. And even the gospel this morning brings us, I think in a really gentle way, into, the, into this paradox. As Jesus heals the, uh, the sickness of, his, of, his, of Simon's mother-in-law. Simon brings Jesus into his home where, where his mother-in-law is, is down in bed with a fever. And, and Jesus arrives, I, I would say right on schedule, and, and with infinite grace 
touches her and heals the fever, which may well have proven fatal to her. So right on schedule, we have this wonderful healing moment in exactly the time that we needed it. But if we want to be a little bit playful, and and maybe even a little uh, meta, we can look at this story and say, in a way, there's a little bit where we're behind schedule too, because what's the first thing that Simon's mother-in-law does when she gets out of bed? She serves him right? She serves the boys. And so I wonder if, if, if a mother who, who hardly gets any time to herself reads this and re- is thinking that, oh, of course, the only time you ever get any peace is when you get COVID. And what does Jesus do? Jesus, with, with grace and love, lifts her out of the illness and says, woman, your faith has made you well. Can you make me a sandwich? Now, obviously, this is, I'm going out of context. And I don't for a minute believe that that was what Jesus was doing. I don't for a minute believe that Jesus saw the same kind of gender dynamics and constructs and limitations that that are the air that we breathe sometimes. I just don't believe it. But I, I do know that far too many folks have taken passages just like this and extrapolated from this systems of power, systems of dominance, patriarchy that God never intended. So a bit behind schedule in a certain way. The key is knowing when to fall back on the Spirit's mysterious pace, and sometimes it is mysterious and slow and plodding, but also know when to pick things up a bit. Jesus' day of miracles continued from Simon's house to uh, to continuing this throughout the day when, when folks started to gather from all over. They were gathering there at Jesus' door, and they were bringing the sick, and they were bringing those with, with, who were possessed with demons, and Jesus cured them, and he cast out the demons. But what was the first thing that he did when the folks with the demons showed up? He clammed them up. He did not allow them to speak, which of course doesn't sound very gracious, right? Because the demons, every, there's always two sides, right? No, you, sometimes you have to actually just not let the demons speak at all. But I think there's something also about staying on schedule, and here's my theory. Jesus knew that the demons were really good at what they did, and that by being good, that meant that they never quite played their hand in an obvious way. So, so a demon who really knew his stuff was not going to come up to Bob and, you know, poof on the shoulder, right, hello, uh, and say, Bob, you should go set that building on fire, right? That's a little too obvious. It's not going to go, Lois, you should go and you should start telling stories about rich, right? Go and do that. They're not going to do that because you're going to figure that out. No, I think the game, the demon game, is a lot more subtle than that. I think what they do is subtly confuse our sense of schedule so that we try to always conform things to the pace that we want or that we need, but may not be at all what God is trying to help us to see. Perhaps the demons want to whisper in our ears to calm down in the face of injustice. Let the process work itself out. Let's get to a place where, where we can all feel good about this before we really move on. Here, ha- have a cup of tea and just rest. Or sometimes those same spirits play the same game but from the different side, convincing us to rush headlong into a fight without, doing our, without first doing our own inner work without first anchoring our vital justice work in grace and love and discipleship, so that what happens 
is not that we have the impact that we want, but rather that we burn ourselves out too quickly or that we simply project ourselves onto other people just in a different way. Jesus doesn't let those demons speak because their game is to co disrupt our connections to the movement and the energy and, yes, the schedule of the great and wild Spirit of God. To be faithful, to be hopeful, to be humble is to be right on schedule. There is work to be done. There are new things to co-create with the Spirit. There is grief to be expressed. And we know that there are so many ways where the people of God have been far too far behind schedule. Coming alongside the Holy Spirit, though, whose pace is mysterious and unknowable, but who carries us out into the world and who simultaneously lifts us up into the generous embrace of God. This is how we begin to move with purpose, with grace, and even with holiness. In this infinitely graceful, presence of God, where forgiveness and resurrection and hope all come together, we hear once again the voice of Jerry, who is also known as the Holy Spirit, who from the right over our shoulder, before we have a chance to jump in and say what we think is going on, proclaims we are right on schedule. Amen. We believe in God who made us all and whose divinity infuses life with the sacred. We believe in the multiple revelations of God, alive in every human heart, expressed in every culture, found in the wisdoms, wisdoms of the world. We believe in Jesus the Christ, who leads us to the fullness of humanity, to what we are meant to become. Through Christ, we become new people, called beyond the consequences of our brokenness, lifted to the fullness of life, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the breath of God on earth, who keeps the Christ vision present to souls yet in darkness, gives life to hearts now blind, infuses energy into spirits yet weary, isolated, searching, and confused. We believe in God who is life. Amen to courage, to hope, to spirit of truth, to nature, to happiness, to wholeness, to the partnership of people in God's plan, to the Christ who calls us beyond the boundaries of our hearts, in the gentry thing that stretches our hearts to the dimensions of God. In all of this, we can surely believe as God does. In the darkness before creation, you made all that lives and breathes. In the darkness of Mary's womb, you formed Jesus, bringer of life. In the darkness of our world, your spirit sustains us. O oh God, you are with us in darkness and in light. Under the cover of darkness, Magi followed the star to the Christ child. We come from the east and we come from the west following you on our different roads, following the same star to the same place. O oh God, you are with us in darkness and in light. In the stillness of the dark, we pray for all who need God's presence in a special way. People who cannot find work, who cannot pay their bills, 
who have no place to live, people who are discouraged and hopeless, people who have become cynical and bitter. O oh God, you are with us in darkness and in light. We live in this world in our bodies. We rejoice in life and breath. Yet when sickness or pain cripples us, we lose our bearings. We feel lost and bewildered. We need your presence to keep us safe. Be with those who have asked for our prayers, especially Larry, Barbara, Marion, Tom, Dawn, Roland, Deborah, Karen, Jim, Nancy, Tim, Lori, Tanya, David, Stuart, Echo, Linda, Bill, Tom, Carol, Viola, the McCann McKinnon and Mullaly families. We pray for loved ones who have died and for their families, especially David Ward, Nancy Ronk, Bill Kyle, Louis Bernhardt, George, George Roboquet, Dolores Juist, Juliana Mosley, and Lachlan McKinnon. We pray for U.S. military personnel and for their families. We pray for our companions in the Diocese of Belize and the Diocese of Tanga, Tanzania. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Provincial Synod and the Provincial Partnerships. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church in South America. We continue to pray for the health of our presiding bishop, Michael B. Curry. We pray for the people of Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine, and for an end to violence and for the vision to seek a new era of peace. We pray for the Congregational Life Mission Team as they support the congregation at Trinity Cathedral through the joys and hardships of life. We offer blessings upon those celebrating birthdays this week, Gary Benjamin, John Cornwell, and Barbara Hermes. O oh God, you are with us in darkness and in light. Thank you for moments of inspiration, for moments of clear vision, where we see who we are and who we are meant to be, where we see where we are and where you want us to go. Give us courage to take the journey that you call us to and give us strength on the road. O oh God, you are with us in darkness and in light. Blessed are you who in created both darkness and light, that you might reveal to us the mysteries of faith. Send us out into the world in confidence to proclaim the revelation of your love and the work you are doing in us and through us. For your kingdom come. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be always with you, and also with you. Peace be with you. I like that move. That was awesome. So I'm like, yeah, I'm back in black. Exactly. Good morning. 
Thank you for being here. I hope you'll be staying with us afterwards for our annual meeting. Uh, just whether you're able to stay or not, remember that most of the information that, that, you, that you need is actually in the, um, in the annual report that was shared yesterday morning, including my pastoral letter, including information from all the mission teams, as well as our, um, uh, as our many ministry leaders. Now, um, just stick around following the service. Stay in your seat because we're going to quickly turn things around and move into our annual meeting. Number of things coming up in the coming week. Next sat Friday and Saturday, our vestry are going on retreat to Bellwether Farm. So I ask that you hold them in your prayers uh, as they step away and discern where we've been and, and where we're going as a cathedral congregation. Also, at 1 p.m. at Church of the Savior in Akron will be the diocesan celebration of Absalom Jones and Barbara Harris. This is an annual celebration uh, that is here at Trinity once every two or three years. This year it will be in Akron. I encourage you to attend if you're able to. It's a profound celebration of ministry and, the mini uh, and in particular Afri to Af African American leaders who have very much shaped our church over the centuries. We are coming up, oh, excuse me, next fr Sunday, this is a change to what we've been publishing. I'll be leading a Dean's Forum. We'll have a, our Bible study as usual, but I'm also going to lead a Dean's Forum on the battle for democracy, which is a, a, an effort from greater Cleveland congregations to engage the community, and particularly the community of Cleveland, to, uh, to do what they call deep canvassing to invite people who have fallen away from the voting process uh, to come back in and to get involved. Uh, and we're trying to discern ways that we as members of Trinity can be a part of that. So we're gonna hear from people from Greater Cleveland Congregations. Kalila Worley is one of them. We're also gonna look at the, um, the, uh, um, the anti-gerrymandering amendment. Uh, that their signature is being collected and Trinity wants to be a part of that as well. So we'll be talking about a lot of really important things that we're going to be look, going through in the next six months and year. So that is going to be the Dean's Forum next Sunday as, alongside Bible study. Hope you can join us. Uh, now, Easter is very early this year, which means that Ash Wednesday is very early this year, which means that Mardi Gras is very early this year. All of that is to say we're a week and a half away from that. Uh, so Mardi, I know Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras is the 13th, is uh, on uh, so Tuesday. Join us in the um, in the in the Cong in the, uh, Cathedral Hall. Uh, we'll have. Wonder for Mardi Gras, it'll be wonderful. There will also be pancake races. I am training every day, running through my neighborhood, wearing a sweatband and running shorts and holding a pancake. Everybody's wondering why I'm doing that. Come and find out exactly why next Tuesday. And then on uh, February 14th, you might call it Ash Valentine's Day. We call it Ash Wednesday this year. Uh, so do plan to be with us uh, to receive the imposition of ashes, uh, either at 7.30, noon, or 6 p.m. And maybe your travels don't take you by the cathedral that day. Uh, hopefully, whether they take you somewhere near a church, whether it's an Episcopal church or not, where you can be a part of that, where ashes can be placed on your forehead and begin as we together begin the holy season uh, of Lent. If you're joining us online, are you near a church that you could get to? Uh, whatever, it, it's such an important part of our process. And I encourage you now uh, to go and think, look at your schedule and think about where you're going to be and how you might participate in that as a way to begin the, the, the journey towards Easter. Finally, at, this end of the at the end of this month, we'll have a concert at Trinity co-sponsored by the um, Roots of American Music. Uh, you'll be hearing more about in the coming weeks as well. Is anybody celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this Sunday? Right. I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship God's holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name.
and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God, through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, 
the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so, as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy. honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed, and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you, now and forever. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. The 
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ poured himself out for us. Through Christ, we share in the same life, the same body, in one body.
ever, ever love. Ever in the blessed life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the God who creates life, the Spirit who loves life, the, the Savior who loves life, and the Spirit who is the fire of life, bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. In peace <laughs> to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>